Okay. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Wendy Singer. I'm Director of Programming for No Shame on You. One moment, I'm letting some folks in. And a pop-up came. Okay, apologies. My name is Wendy Singer. I am Director of Programming for No Shame on You. On behalf of our volunteers, staff, and board of directors, we welcome you to today's program, part of No Shame on You's monthly Feed Your Mind lunchtime series. On today's menu, the emotional experience of pregnancy and childbirth, um, understanding perinatal mood and anxiety conditions. Founded in, two, in 2014, No Shame on You is dedicated to eliminating stigma associated with mental health conditions so people who need help will seek it. Family members and friends will know how to provide proper support and save lives. No Shame on You achieves this mission through community outreach programs, educational presentations, workshops, daily online tools and resources, blogs, podcasts, and more. So if you haven't followed us already on your social media channels, take out your phones and look us up on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, since the pandemic um, started, we have offered hundreds and hundreds of free and virtual programs to our over 125,000 social media following. Um, we would like to thank our generous funders for supporting our important work, and a special shout out to our community partners who are listed on the pre-program slides. And now for a bit of housekeeping. You should keep your sound on mute to avoid feedback. Please feel free to share questions privately in the chat to me, Wendy, no shame on you. Um, also, if you're comfortable, you could also raise your hand and, and ask your question yourself, but I will be moderating. Hi, can everyone hear me or am I frozen? Um, we can hear, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, you're a little frozen, Laura. So I'm going to keep going. Until okay, keep going. <laughs> okay. Um, and now I'd like to introduce our excellent presenter today. Laura uh, Laporte is our presenter. Uh, Laura has worked for near, nearly 20 years as a licensed clinical social worker with the pioneering perinatal depression program at North Shore University Health System, Edward Elmhurst. Laura provided support for the nation's first 24-7 perinatal mood hotline and an, um, answered by live licensed mental health professionals. Laura co-facilitated universal mood screening in pregnancy and postpartum and administers 9,000 screenings a year. Laura currently manages a five-year federal study on breaking down barriers um, to perinatal depression and anxiety treatment. And in addition to her work, Laura has a small, just on the side, a little extra, a small psychotherapy practice with expertise in perinatal mood, mood and loss. She holds a master's degree from the University of Chicago in social service administration and is a former management consultant um, with Accenture. Um, and without further ado, I give it to Laura. Oh, we lost Laura, everybody. So hang tough, hang tough for just a moment. I see. Oh my gosh, no, we have people coming from all over and uh, oh, great. we were just checking in. So thank you so much. And you should be able, able to, to share. share your screen and take it away. Fantastic. Thanks for your patience, everybody. It's nice to be here. Let me put on presentation view for you all and put on the right setting. So I'm so glad you guys could be here today. I was just telling Wendy that um, no shame on you and the type of work that they do is so fantastic for um, the perinatal time because this is such a stigmatized time for women to have any type of negative experience at all. If you Google images about pregnancy, this is what women see. And I love to call this the gaze. This is what women are subjected to. Here's the myth of motherhood that pregnancy is uh, is wondrous and delightful. There are no pregnancies are unplanned. There's no financial concern. There's no, but they have perfect relationships and perfect support, perfect access to healthcare. Um, and this is the myth in which women are becoming pregnant and becoming mothers. And we all know the reality can be much, much different than this. 
Um, so it's really important that we do, we do destigmatizing work and let women have a full range of emotions and get treated for conditions and, be, and not be too afraid to speak up. In fact, when I, I was just pulling out like even my old book from when I, I needed the joy of pregnancy, that this type of book, I mean, would it surprise anybody to know that there isn't one single chapter in here on joy? None. Like we all go off chuckle, like, of course not. You know, what's in here are things like, you know, placenta previa, if I just kind of look through and um, like, oh yeah, um, preterm labor and um, sciatica and all of these things are none of this, is, there's no joy in here, but this is literally how we are we're talking about it in this context, even she's doing the gaze. And as when I bought that many years ago, um, earlier in my career, um, it didn't even phase me that I was being sold this idea of pregnancy being this mythically wonderful time. Um, so this is what the, this is the context, and the reality is that almost one in seven. And actually, this is pretty conservative because I think the number, the incidence is going up. One in seven women will have anxiety or depression in pregnancy or in the postpartum. It's lower for fathers. Um, but this is what most women are experiencing. That's the reality. So today I'm going to talk you through different conditions. And I want to talk you through the different conditions because we, there's a lot of confusion about what they are. Some people just refer to something as postpartum or you'll see a tragedy in the news with very terrible outcomes. And people think that people think that's what it means to have a post like postpartum depression. And that isn't true. Um, I'm going to talk about who, what risk factors are more associated. Um, there are wonderful treatment options and then some great resources. Um, I want to talk about just two, just a quickly definition perinatal for this presentation. I'm referring to any time in pregnancy and up to one year postpartum. Um, that's how us, uh, the clinicians view this. And the other thing I want to mention is I'm going to use the term mother today, um, but I recognize that that term doesn't feel right for every person, every person who gives birth. And it, it's also still applicable. I still want to acknowledge people who for whom that word might not fit if you um, did not give birth, but are also functioning in that role. Okay, so I'm including today's talk, Baby Blues. This is, uh, and, and all of the other perinatal mood and anxiety conditions, I've also included post-traumatic stress because I think that's really important to focus on. So you can see that there's some variability here. Baby blues is actually, it's so common, most women experience it. It's not actually considered a, a, a perinatal mood condition, like a disorder, um, but it's really just considered a normal part of adjustment. And the reason why, our best theory about why this happens to women in all different cultures, and not just in a Western culture where we have less support, um, is that they think it's about the dysregulation of a, of a bonding hormone, oxytocin, because it seems to really peak around the time that milk is coming in and, and milk has come in. Um, so that's our best guess about why this happens. Women can just feel a little like they're crying for no reason, but then they're okay. Um, they can maybe feel a little more irritable, moods going up and down. There might be some sadness or feeling like overwhelmed, confused, hard to concentrate. But a key thing is they still experience some joy. They can still take pleasure in something. If they had a break, they would appreciate it. They would feel they would feel better after the break. Um, some women are just, we, they've gone through such um, rapid hormonal change, and some women are more sensitive to that change. They've just given birth. There's a big letdown in reality has set in. They might be physically uncomfortable or recovering from um, a tough delivery or labor. Um, realizing the responsibility of having to take care of the baby, not getting sleep, um, their whole identity has changed. You know, the, the, the freedom, they're recognizing some of the freedom um, is gone and they may be grieving who they once were, a, a, a woman who could take a shower whenever she wanted to or go eat something when she wanted to, that's gone. And then you know, social media has not done <laughs> many favors to women in the in the perinatal time thinking you're supposed to somehow be wonderful and get back to body weight and feel great when you're really your your body has been given over for some other purpose for a long time. It's really hard for women to feel like they're in control of their um, of their bodies. 
Um, so I wanted to mention um, before I go into a list of symptoms of what could be perinatal depression or perinatal anxiety, I want to share with you um, a great list from the postpartum stress center. And these are these are the words of women. These are the things that we can tend to hear because um, I think that's more important. Um, so it feels scary. It feels out of control. Um, and this is a big one. It feels like I'm not, I, I, I'm not myself. I don't feel like I'll ever be myself again. That is probably, that's so diagnostic to me. So those three things really are very important. They feel that something isn't right with them and they're afraid that they're never going to be themselves again, that this is what motherhood feels like. It can be quite, quite paralyzing for women. Um, it feels like each day is a hundred hours long. Um, I had a, a patient who said she would stare at the clock um, and just wait until her husband, she said her husband came home at 6 p.m. and she would just stare, 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 stare. When is he coming? When is he coming? When is he coming? Um, because she just needed a break. Um, feeling like a bad mother is also a big one. Feeling like I have no patience for anything anymore. Again, irritability is a really big one. Um, and it feels like I'm always going to feel like this. So there is like a sense of hopelessness here. Um, and my one of the most important things I think clinicians can do is to instill a sense of hope again for these mothers because they feel like something has happened to them and it's never going to change. For today's presentation, I'm going to separate out depression and anxiety because there's, might, there's, there's some, some category difference, but really they're experienced a lot together or they're blended together. But just for the sake of, you know, people using, still using terms depression and anxiety, I'm gonna, I'm gonna list them this way. Um, perinatal depression can feel like a lot of guilt or shame or again, like hopelessness. But there's also an agitated quality to this. They can feel really irritable. That is the number one I th thing I hear women say, depression anx or anxious, uh, depression or anxiety, irritability is the number one thing we hear. Um, with depression, there's also a loss of interest or joy. Like if you give mom a break, why don't you go out and get yourself um, a, a, a bite to eat or get yourself a coffee? She won't feel that won't that won't do it. That when that, that break, she just thinks I have to come back. I, I'm dreading it. I don't even want to go. I don't want to even leave the house. I just I have to come back, and I'm, I know it's not going to be okay. Um, so that's something different. Um, crying and sadness, lots of worry and racing thoughts. There is some overlap with anxiety here. Really can't concentrate, very confused and overwhelmed. You're gonna hear words like, I feel like a bad mother because they are having a negative experience. One thing that um, I like to mention is women can have insomnia even, but, I, I, but, but that's kind of gonna happen with a new mother. So I always like to make the distinction of when you get a chance to sleep at night, can you still not fall asleep in between feedings, for example? Then, then I get more concerned about that. Change in appetite. Um, is also hard because mom is breastfeeding, but you want to tease that out a little bit more. Some women can have suicidal thoughts. Generally, in my experience, this is just an escape from the stress of their current lives, not, lives, not that they actually want to end their lives. Um, I was just looking at, um, I'll explain this more a little bit later, we have a, a, a hotline, a free 24-7 confidential hotline, and um, therapists like me staff it, and we get calls all the time, um, and I just took the most recent call, I just checked our database and thought I would share this um, statement from a mom, she was calling, she's not feeling well, we're sorting through what's going on, and of course, we always assess if somebody's having some suicidal thoughts, and what she just said was, I wish I could walk away from all of it and not come back. All right, so that's the way that women women can feel. Um, homicidal thoughts, usually women just have um, thoughts of something terrible happening to the baby. I have the word, the word ego is astonic in here. It just means it's not okay with them. This is mortifying to them. Why would I think about dropping my baby or throwing up? Why would I ever have a thought like that? This is really just, just disturbing. Um, and so how do you know it's baby blues versus depression or something else? Well, we look for two things. We look for persistence. So this is lasting longer than two weeks and it's really gotta impair functioning. Mom can't leave the house. Mom can't sleep. Mom um, is afraid to take care of the baby, something like that. 
There's a woman whose YouTube videos I really love. Um, this is from Therapy in a Nutshell. And I was looking for some of those images of the gaze that I showed you earlier. And I love that she has this. Why is no one talking about postpartum anxiety and OCD? So she's become a mother here. And I really like that because I think she's right. Postpartum depression got all the press, but there, but we see so many, you ask anybody who does this work and they'll tell you, we see anxiety. That's a lot of what we see, mostly what we see is anxiety. And I really like this graphic because um, of just all of the, all of these symptoms kind of floating around her. Um, anxiety has a lot of the same symptoms as depression, but I would also say there is this physical agitation and just constant rumination and agitation that's going on. So women may feel like unable to catch their breath, their thoughts are racing, it's constant worrying, may, may be feeling just overwhelmed, guilty, something bad is about to happen, um, all of those things, shaking and trembling, um, all of those, those feelings. Um, so I was looking at another um, recent call to our hotline, and here is a, an example of that experience. So a mom called this week, she lives with her partner. They have three kids um, under the age of eight. She said she started to feel irritable and anxious, sad, and just raging. Um, and then she said, I found out the next month that I was unexpectedly pregnant with my fourth child. Um, she's having a lot of nausea and she can't leave the house because of that. Um, sleep is impacted due to her nausea. Um, anxiety is worsened. Um, and here's something to note too, is that she felt she never got over postpartum anxiety with her last child, who's a year old. Um, and now she's really frightened that the symptoms are going to get worse. Um, and she had, yeah, so she's had it in her last pregnancy. And um, so that's also a risk factor, which we'll talk about, but that's sort of the, the experience of I'm physically and mentally unwell and it's all being exacerbated. Obsessive compulsive disorder is, um, it does have a lower prevalence, but I really, I, it is also considered to be underreported because of some of the thoughts um, and experiences that women are having are so stigmatized that they're afraid to speak up. Um, so I'll share some examples. Um, obsessive compulsive disorder, so obsessions are just thoughts or images that feel really intrusive and usually unwanted. I worked with a woman who was pregnant during COVID and she had her first ep ep ever episode of OCD um, about two months after COVID started. And she was really worried that the baby, that her family was gonna get COVID. Um, she had a sort of a classic contamination fear. So for her, she was really worried. It was springtime, you know, it was May. You know, May. She was really worried that um, about the fertilizer being used on grass, like uh, on, in her neighborhood and things like that. So she was just, she didn't want to step on the grass or she um, was worried about household contaminants. So she would be researching constantly. She would be, um, she would have the thought that something bad's going to happen to her baby. It's going to be her fault. He's not going to develop. And, and she knew that this isn't, this is not okay. What I'm doing is not okay, but she was compelled or had a compulsion, a behavior to go on the internet research every ingredient, um, cleaned a lot, washed her hands a lot, her hands were bleeding, so, you know, and um, so she just couldn't, she would track like if, if her husband stepped in the, from the yard and his shoes might've had something on them, she would want him to, to take his shoes off and she'd have to clean the area where he was or his clothes that might've touched something that she thought could hurt the baby. And um, this was really, really upsetting for her and very, um, very paralyzing in her life. Um, so, you know, she has this, these anxious thoughts, so obsessions create the anxiety and compulsions reduce the anxiety, but they only ever do it temporarily. So women find themselves in this endless loop of trying to solve a problem that is bothering them. Um, and a lot, yes, fears of intentionally or accidentally harming the baby. That was also true for, for, um, for my patient. And then counting, checking, cleaning, other repetitive behaviors can really make the, the anxiety go down, but again, only temporarily. Um, I had another mother um, who was told at a, an early pediatric appointment that her baby um, her baby's head was measuring a little large. So then mom measured the baby's head at every, every diaper change, right? Several times a day um, because she just, 
it, she felt anxious and then she would measure it, but that doesn't solve it. So she, you know, there's the loop she was going through. Another mom, um, I know she was worried that the crib wasn't safe. So she would take apart the crib each day to see if it was stable. Um, so part of them knows that this is, but the fear is so great um, that that just dominates their behavior. Um, it, pregnancy in the postpartum is the most common um, cause of a new case of OCD in women. And for those women who already have OCD, about a third of them will have another episode in the perinatal time. And here is the, the incidence. But again, I think it can, it's probably going to be much higher because there are some um, symptoms that moms could be afraid to report, like an intrusive thought about something terrible happening to the baby, or even worse, having this unwanted thought that what if I do something to the baby? Um, and those are really difficult to disclose. Okay, so I'll mention bipolar very briefly. So there's some depressive symptoms, mania symptoms, like decreased need for sleep without fatigue. We had a mother whose family called our hotline and they said she's not herself. Something is, is, is not right. So we always want to speak to the mother and it was three in the morning and she just had a baby and she was folding laundry and she just said, I am so fine. I feel effing amazing. <laughs> she like, we were like, it was just the language she used and the way she was just describing this. She just didn't need any sleep. Um, and that's different, right? That was different for her and her family noticed this different uh, difference. So, you know, she had some, a little bit of grandiosity and some, you know, these sorts of things. Um, but that that's worrisome because people who have these bipolar symptoms listed here, there's a, a risk of psychosis um, and definitely a relapse of, of depressive symptoms and mania if medication is discontinued too. So that's another big consideration. So two thirds of women, if they don't stay on their medication in pregnancy could face a relapse. Um, okay, postpartum psychosis is the type of condition that gets um, in the news a lot, but I want to make this important point. Having postpartum depression, anxiety, OCD, any of those conditions is not the same as having psychosis, and they don't bleed into each other. If I'm depressed, oh no, am I going to have psychosis? They're really considered pretty distinct conditions, so nothing to panic about. Um, so psychosis, fortunately, is relatively rare, um, although I always, uh, it is relatively rare, but it's still one to two women out of every thousand births. If North, North Shore University Health System, for example, um, delivers 5,000 women a year, this is five to 10 women who could have postpartum psychosis. Um, one of the reassuring things about the condition is it usually has a very abrupt onset, can be right after delivery, like 48 hours, but most often in the research, they say within the first two weeks. Um, there's a strong correlation with bipolar. Um, it in increases the chance of psychosis, especially when women aren't given sleep. So women who have a history of bipolar should really be given some protected sleep if at all possible always considered a medical emergency. And the important thing here is that symptoms can come and go. So families think something's wrong. Oh, wait, and then she like feels a little better later. Um, you want to go to the emergency room and explain she's fine now and maybe isn't reporting anything now, but she did or she was acting this way. So that's a good thing to keep in mind. Psychosis is a true break from reality. So women could have some scary or violent thoughts and not think, um, unlike OCD, not think, that's a terrible thought. Why would I ever have a thought like that? Um, sometimes the thoughts could have religious overtones, such as a perceived or direct communication from God or from the devil. I saw a woman on our inpatient unit who was pregnant, and she was convinced that the baby was a demon, and she was contemplating termination. Um, Oh, really, an in a total inability to sleep is something we see. I think um, in our experience, when we hear that moms are up all night pacing, that's something that sort of starts to get our, our red flag up, um, confused or disoriented. And then, you know, with any type of psychosis, it, delusional thoughts or thoughts that are not based in reality or hallucinations, hearing or seeing things that aren't there. 
I worked with a mom on the inpatient unit who um, just looked like she could be in your new mom's group, <laughs> like just sitting there, you know, calmly, you know, uh, well put together, just, you know, talking about losing your baby weight. And I asked her about, you know, hallucinating, seeing or hearing things. And she said, yes, I am. And I said, what are you, what's your experience right now? And she said, I hear music playing in our room, like a radio, and there was no music. So she, she was experiencing that. She also had an, um, visual hallucination that somebody had entered like a woman she knew entered like her bedroom and had gone to the drawer and like exited out the window um and that this woman was trying to have a relationship with her husband none of that was true so there's paranoia there's a visual hallucination um and she was also hearing things that weren't there Uh, women can feel depressed and euphoric disorganized thinking behavior bizarre thinking Families will usually know something is not right. Um, The most significant risk factors, though, um, for postpartum psychosis is a personal or a family history of bipolar or schizophrenia or any type of time a woman has had a previous psychotic episode. Um, And so there's a famous case about this is Andrea Yates and her lawyer. Andrea fits a lot of this profile of women who are susceptible to postpartum psychosis. So Andrea had a history of of significant mental illness. Andrea had, um, you know, had been psychiatrically hospitalized several times, several suicide attempts, had a history of some psychotic episodes, and she was not well managed after the birth of her fifth child. And so she had this command from the devil who told her that to save her children, she had to end their lives. And she did. Um, Fortunately, a second hearing found that she was not guilty by reason of insanity. Although I hate to use that word, but that's the word that seems to get quoted. I don't know what the law was, particularly at that time, but it was just 20 years ago. Um, And Andrea um, now um, lives in... um, a a mental health facility and she's actually quite happy there and refuses to be released into the general um into she does not want to leave there she feels very comfortable and secure there um and is is doing is has recovered um but this is just a tragic case of somebody who didn't get the right treatment and was initially very misunderstood by the legal system I want to make a distinction between OCD and psychosis. This is sort of a when to worry slide. Women who have thoughts of harm coming to the baby, um, you know, if they're horrified by the thoughts, want us to do protective things, like they know this isn't right, they have the insight, they think that this is totally unreasonable. Why would I have a thought of harm like that coming to my baby? I'm super worried about it. And I don't, I'm almost afraid to take care of the baby. That's more in line with OCD. In the case of a mother like Andrea Yates, who um, she really just didn't have the insight. She, you know, doesn't, unaware that these aren't reasonable thoughts. She really believed that the devil wanted her to do the right thing for her children. And she just didn't have that sort of awareness that what she was going through um, was of a psychosis. I also want to mention post-traumatic stress here. Um, About nine women, uh, 9% of women will experience some post-traumatic stress after giving birth. Most often this is caused by, I want to emphasize perceived trauma during delivery or the postpartum. It does not matter what a healthcare professional thinks, it matters what the mother thinks. I had a client who had an emergency C-section and at her four week postpartum visit, with her obstetrician, she said, I want to talk about my traumatic childbirth. And he looked at her and said, trauma is a strong word. And so that did not help her recovery. (laughs) Um, Her response at the time was terror, helplessness. She didn't know what was going on. She didn't feel like she was being communicated with. And she has, she keeps re-experiencing these memories and they cause so much physical distress for her. She didn't even want to go anywhere near her OB office or near the hospital where she had her um, traumatic delivery. Um, And she's just got a lot of physical arousal. Um, She has lots of anxiety and panic. And for some women, they feel a sense of like detachment um, when when this is happening to them. The way it might look in a postpartum, um, avoiding the baby, just, just cannot really sort of bond with the baby. Um, No sexual activity, 
Um, and in the case of my client too, she just did not, she really is having a hard time thinking about having a second child. She doesn't know if she can go through all of that again. There are other things leading up to this as well and in her postpartum, but um, this was really tough on her. And um, the child, uh, uh, him or herself might also be um, something that we traumatize. And then imagine that for a mom who's wanted to have a baby, felt like he, she was gonna die, maybe the baby was going to die. And then being around the baby just makes her feel so anxious. And again, like this is supposed to be the best time of your life. How could you feel this way? So there's a lot of guilt and shame that can come as a result of that. Avoiding other mothers, because who wants to see that the happy moms who think everything's great. <laughs> Um, and that leads to more isolation. Okay, I just wanna check the time here. Okay, um, so what causes this? Well, there's no single cause, um, but it's really attributed to, know, it's absolutely nothing a mom did. Moms don't do anything to become depressed or anything to become anxious. They're not thinking the wrong way, eating the wrong thing, doing anything wrong. They're not weak, they're not bad. This is just a common complication. They actually considered the most common complication of pregnancy. Um, and it really just comes from a woman's individual biology. Some women are just hormonally sensitive to the, um, that change, drop in hormones brings on mood changes, something in her environment or just individual psychological factors like a personal history of anxiety or depression. Probably the biggest um, indicator of um, having a, being at risk for a perinatal mood or anxiety condition is to have had a previous one, like you saw in the example earlier. Um, a history of outside of the perinatal time, depression or anxiety, um, not having support from family and friends. I was looking in the, uh, you know, I wasn't, I can't forget if this is the example I shared with you, but I was looking in our, our hotline database and um, there's a dad who was doing all the night shifts. So on the positive side, she was able to get some sleep, which is fantastic. That's not a luxury many women have, um, but for her, it was. I'm always so happy to see something like that, but unfortunately that's not so typical. Um, pregnancy or delivery complications, and absolutely financial stress or poverty, poverty has a real, a real impact on mothers. Um, half of all pregnancies are unplanned. It is a huge financial burden that women don't feel like they have the, the place to talk about. Um, history of or current abuse can certainly be an indicator. We know from the research that domestic violence actually increases during a pregnancy. Intuitively, I think people would think it would be the opposite, but that isn't true. Um, abusers want to exert more control over a mom um, during her pregnancy. She's going to be interacting with you know, other people outside of, the, of his control, and the baby might be getting more um, of her, um, it might, she might be proactive with the baby, so it's actually... Um, it's actually a danger, more dangerous time for, uh, for, for violence. And having a high needs infant, having a baby who's in the NICU. I have a mom in my um, private practice whose baby um, stopped breathing, turned blue, um, had an, a NICU stay um, for a different reason, like it was a very difficult way for her to start mothering. Mothering to her was full of just utter panic and worry and life or death for her. The good news is that treatment is really effective and we have lots of different options for moms. So psychotherapy is really considered a great option. The most studied types of psychotherapy are cognitive behavioral therapy um, for the perinatal time and also something called interpersonal therapy or IPT, which is really about a lot of role changes and asking for help. It's also great if therapists can bring the babies in session that is very helpful. There are also other types of therapies. Body-based therapies are great too. Other, you know, um, for trauma, things like that. I'm just listing the ones um, here that are always um, associated with the research. And by the way, same thing for risk factors. There are, you know, I list the ones that have the most robust research, but demographically, we see differences too. Yeah, younger women, um, women of color, the LGBTQ community, people who tend to have already pre-existing conditions of more depression or more anxiety because of their or trauma um, can also just be more at risk. Support groups can yeah. be great. Oh, go ahead. We have a couple of questions, but oh, yeah. we'll save to them. But one, one of them is, is pertinent to this treatment options. Sure. Um, 
do you have any knowledge about the risks of taking medication during pregnancy for someone who has had was taking medicine before pregnancy for anxiety yeah. disorder or depression. Yes. Um, yeah. Any thoughts on that? Absolutely. So the so no, it's a really wonderful question. So women tend to not want to try or try not to take medication in a pregnancy, but there are times with a, with a good with a good psychiatrist, or if you have if you're lucky enough to have access to one. Um, it really depends on the mother's comfort. There are uh, there are studies that say um, if a woman's depression or anxiety is pretty significant, that there's that they recommend mom staying on it during pregnancy, especially if when she came off in a previous pregnancy, she really deteriorated. Um, so it really depends on mom. Um, the I had a, a an example. I'll give an example. Um, I had a mom in my private practice who you know, pregnant, went off of all of her medications, struggled, definitely struggled in pregnancy, but resumed them in the postpartum. And that was the right choice for her. Then the same client came back when she was pregnant a second time. She's like, no way I'm staying out the whole time. <laughs> so it just depends. Everybody is really different. I think you just want to take into consideration somebody's personal view of risk and um, and their personal, the severity of what they, where they've been, what they're going through. Um, but yeah, I, I think it just needs to be very personalized and women need to be given an option. I think that's the most important thing. Women need to be given an option. I actually have resources here for any mom who maybe doesn't have access to um, a psychiatrist, which is difficult. Um, her physician um, or midwife or any prescriber can call um, and get a good consultation. Um, so this patient can do, can get this good advice without actually having, you know, to pay out of pocket or wait a long time, or they don't have, and you know, if they have public or versus private insurance, which is always difficult, um, there are still options for her. Yeah, so there's no hard and fast rule. Thank you, appreciate it. Okay. Sure. Um, so medication, and then always um, for acute cases, hospitalization, any thoughts of self-harm or suicide. And if women can have the luxury of getting to eat or move or sleep, those are always really wonderful things um, for her as well. And then I just want to emphasize for psychosis, this is just a medical emergency, 911, ER, explain the symptoms to the staff because symptoms can wax and wane. Um, and all, even the most severe, you know, psychosis can be treated. That's an important thing to know. So how can loved ones help? I take this again from Postpartum Stress Center. I like, um, I like their list here. Um, let, try to get her to rest. Take her seriously. Listen to her concerns. So say, oh, all new moms worry. Don't worry. And of course, you're not sleeping. Nobody's sleeping, right? Um, go to the doctor with her, to a therapist. Um, help her set limits. Just sit with her, tell her you love her, remind her she's not always going to feel this way. Um, you know, you're not going anywhere. You'll wait together for as long as it takes. Let her do what she needs to do to take care of herself. And then if you're a partner or parent or grandparent or friend who's looking after someone, also look after yourself too and just really do what you can to be there for her. So I... Um, this is, uh, if you forget everything, you don't know exactly where to send someone or you still have questions, one of us um, can always answer anyone's questions from anywhere um, by our, our free 24 seven moms line. Um, we're funded by the Illinois Department of Public Health in part and some private donations. But this line is answered 24 seven like by people like me and we can help talk you through it. I have a friend who, or, you know, I'm worried about so-and-so or I'm worried I'm pregnant. And we can talk to somebody in any language. And I just have English and Spanish here, but um, we have a, an interpretive services line. We can talk to anybody in any language. And we go absolutely out of our way to find the absolute best, most valid, re reliable referrals for someone, no matter what, the, you know, what their ability to pay is, no matter where they live, no matter what they're going through. We try to have every, any resource we can for a mom and we will go and do research for her um, if we need to. 
Um, I wasn't sure who's going to be on the call today, but anybody who's outside of the Chicago area, outside of the No Shame on You um, uh, headquarters, um, here is a National Maternal Mental Health Line that's new, um, which is great. And um, this is affiliated with a group called Postpartum Support International. Um, so you can see it here. It's really, it's fantastic. You can call, um, you can text. Um, they can talk to, they have English and Spanish speaking um, counselors. Um, and they also have interpretive services in other languages. I can't say enough about this wonderful organization. Um, Postpartum Support International has so many different, for example, free groups online. This is just some of them. And they really try to take care of all, women's, all women with all kinds of needs. So they have a, a mood group, Spanish group, military, uh, neonatal, neonatal intensive care unit um, group, South Asian women, Black Mamas Matter support group, queer parents, you, ever, you know, all of these different types so that everybody can feel included, like somebody's really gonna understand their particular needs um, is, uh, is wonderful and one for dads as well. So they'd really try, and this I don't even think is the exhaustive list. They're always changing, um, and which is great. If someone doesn't like calling and likes it's more of a texter, there are two texting options. Personally, I always want someone to call, but I get that the times are changing. <laughs> Everyone wants to text. So there is uh, the text line and there is um, 988 Lifeline, but these are not perinatal specific. But if it's the difference between somebody calling at, at versus texting and te or texting versus nothing, I would like someone to text. Um, some of our um, really wonderful group psychotherapy practices I list here, and this can be given to you all in a PDF form at the end. These are these are local to um, to Chicago mostly. I think nurture therapy is also in a few other states, um, but these are really wonderful practices who have very knowledgeable therapists and do really great work. And there's others. This is just um, these are just the ones I was thinking of. Um, I also want to highlight some trusted um, psychiatrists. Um, it's really important to find some reproduct those with reproductive expertise. And obviously, based on that question earlier, we really want someone who really gets it right. We don't want women shamed and ripped off of their medications and completely deteriorate. That is not okay. Um, and um, under psychiatry and medication management, the ones that are highlighted or the ones that are bolded serve women um, with public aid and healthcare alternative systems, which is fantastic, will serve women without insurance too. So this is really great for, they serve a, a, a large um, Latino population. Um, there was a, and we were lucky enough in Illinois to have an intensive outpatient program, so a higher level of care um, through Ascension, which used to be Amita. Um, that's great. That's great for moms. And then some really good um, intensive outpatient or partial hospitalization programs. Compass and is great. And Chicago Behavioral Health will also work with people who have public insurance as well as private. I have a, a soft spot for this group. I think they're fantastic. I used to be a part of it. So I love it. It's free. Um, Beyond the Baby Blues, um, they're doing groups all virtually, but they actually break it up. They have, a, they usually get good critical mass, which is why I like to emphasize this one. It's been around for a long time. Um, they'll do a pregnancy one, a postpartum one, a loss group. They're doing it. They're just finally getting, um, they got the funding and they got the, um, the, the facilitation ready to do Spanish groups for Spanish speaking women. It's totally free. What I love about this one is that a lot of groups will show up, it's once a month, there's no cohesion, there's no bonding, and then you go away and a whole different set of people comes in the next month, which is easy, I get that, it's, it's the way that facilitation, uh, it's trying to be so inclusive and doing a six week pro close group with the same group of women is very hard to do, but Beyond the Baby Blues manages to do it and I think they're great and I love the women who lead this group, I think they're so incredibly competent. Um, so this is a wonderful, a wonderful place for women. And here for any professionals who might be on, um, again, like postpartum support's great. I love the postpartum stress center. That's also great. Postpartum progress, a lot of good handouts for moms. And then if anybody wants to know more about research, I think uh, Mass General MG, uh, Hospital, MGH, is fantastic. Um, and then the last two here are um, for 
professionals as well, I guess, as patients. So um, there, um, there's a psychiatric consult line. So you can actually, um, a prescriber, so an obstetrician, midwife or family doctor can, um, you know, go online and request, I have, a, I have a, a, a pregnant mom and she's wondering about, you know, about taking medication in her pregnancy, what should I do? Um, so that's available. And then Illinois Doc Assist does the same thing. You get access to really great um, psychiat psychiatrists or psychiatric nurses who can really guide you. I was actually the first person to ever call the PSI, perinatal consult line, because I wanted to test it out. <laughs> I'm like, does this work? How long does it take? Can I start giving this to patients? Um, so that's great for women who don't have, it's hard to access a psychiatrist. Um, so those are great options. Those are some references. Um, and I can answer any questions that you guys might have. I can stop sharing as well, if that's easier. Okay, awesome. We do have a few questions, so I appreciate it. Um, I, thought th I thought this was a fantastic question. Um, so I appreciate the person who asked it. What is the incidence of postpartum depression and other disorders after a miscarriage? And how can that oh. be addressed? Oh gosh, I don't know the exact, oh, I don't know the exact answer to that. I don't know what the prevalence is, but I do a lot of loss work. And I can tell you um, that anxiety definitely spikes, um, but I'm not sure what the, how, what the, what the relative increase is. I don't know, but it, it, I will tell you anecdotally without question, absolutely women who have a previous loss are, are definitely anxious in a pregnancy. Um, and I've seen, um, yeah, this comes up a lot. I'm trying to think. Yeah, and the anxiety, usually it, it, it's there until at least they surpass the previous gestational age of the loss, but sometimes it can go even longer and sometimes it can go in successive pregnancies. So definitely, I, I don't know who asked that, but yeah, I definitely see that, but I don't know the exact prevalence. Um, here's another kind of practical question on how you might advise someone. Um, this person says that they, you know, as all new mothers probably experience they are getting zero rest. They're always sleeping with one eye half open. So they're never in a deep sleep yes. and um, they're in a complete brain fog because of this. Do you have any suggestions? Yeah. Um, the, I, I, women um, need the, one of the big tasks of becoming a mother, I feel like is learning to ask for help. And I, I ask women to, um, to let go of the idea that they have to do everything and you really want to without any shame ask people to let you sleep and it's not always it's not always possible i get that but um but i really want them to sort of who are we going to call what's the plan going to be can so and so come in give them this shift say will you come in i need to sleep will you come and watch the baby at this time have people come on the weekend so mom can try to get just a little bit of sleep um, but it's, it's hard to come by. I mean, when I saw in the note that that dad was letting, taking the night shift, I'm always like, yes, if they can stagger, like mom goes to bed early, dad stays up for a feeding, then mom or partner, and then um, mom takes over. Anyway, you can stagger sleep um, is a good one. So yeah, I think asking for help is a big, is a big thing because you're right to protect someone's sleep is so crucial. My gosh, I remember it, yeah. it was not a good time no. for a long time. Um, <laughs> Another question. This is another practical one that came in. When I, I'm a, I'm a new mother, and when I'm when I'm, let me find it again. I'm a new mother, and when my baby cries, I become anxious. Yes. And in turn, I have this reaction where I start to sweat, and I can't stop sweating. Is that normal? Uh, I don't, it sounds more like a medical question, but certainly, I mean, if you're feeling anxious, sweating is a natural response to that. I'm sorry that, well, first of all, I'm glad you're here and it's going to get better and it's, you're going to be okay. Um, but I, but I, yeah, I think, you know, sweating, I, I heard that, um, yeah, I mean, women have all kinds of reactions. I also think, I don't know how postpartum you are, but um, I do think that night sweats, are, there is the hormonal component. I have heard that anecdotally as well. So I bet you've got a physical reaction and, and I think you've got, you know, maybe an anxious reaction and certainly I can understand the sweating. That's part of, that's part of anxiety, right? And it's just part of hormonal change as well. So I think you have both of those factors going in there. If you are worried, of course, I always have to tell you to contact your OB or, or nurse midwife, but but I do, it doesn't sound outside the realm of typical to me. Okay, great. 
Um, that is all the questions that were submitted to me. So I'll leave it if anyone else wants to unmute and ask something. I'll just give you 10 seconds to think about that. Thank you all for coming. And while while you're um, while we're waiting to see if there's anything else, I wanted to say that we will be sending you an email um, probably early next week that will include all the resources and the presentation slides. Um, so do, fear not. Um, we also will have this recording posted on No Shame on You's YouTube channel, so you can refer to it any any time or share it with um, friends and family who you think may benefit. Um, our goal is for everybody to have access to these um, materials. Um, and um, yeah, it doesn't look like any other questions. So I really want to thank you, Laura. Um, I think the, the I thought it was a wonderful presentation. And um, with what I loved about it was the background information. I loved what you can do to help family and members and friends, because that's right in line with our mission and the practical resources, tips and tools. So I, I really appreciate it. Um, if everyone I put in the chat just a really quick survey that takes literally less than two minutes to fill out, it helps us make sure that we're hitting the mark and reporting back to our generous funders so we can keep doing these free sessions. Um, and um, I hope everyone as well, look out for our next Feed Your Mind session next month. Um, we'll be partnering with Jocelyn Center here in the Chicagoland area where we're gonna have a candid discussion. I'm gonna be in conversation with a woman, a counselor named um, Kate Black Blaker. Um, and we're gonna be talking about um, parenting teens. Um, so another realm. Um, so thank you so much and have a great day, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Laura.